Would you like to come to the stage for your bus? <laughs> Can I say something? Um, this theatre is fantastic. It's what, yeah, it's what it's all about. There's, we've got no support for the arts. These people put this on. A lot of volunteers. It's a fantastic thing. Please come here around for the queue. Yeah. Well, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and congratulations because this DVD, Blu ray, has been yeah, very successful. It's uh, top of the Blu ray charts. Oh, yeah. Well, was and, yeah, until Mamma Mia comes back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, only, it's only a little short thing. <laughs> um, and the, yeah, the BFI have been struggling to keep up with the demand, I hear. Is that right? I think so. I know I haven't got any yeah. copies. <laughs> Um, so, the first question I wanted to ask, I'll, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to everyone. Um, the first one was uh, about meeting the film, Julie, and when did you first meet him? I was at uh, Northampton Art School with Bill Drummond in 1970. We were both 16. And, um, yeah, so I met him then, and then we went various ways. And then we joined up again both working as chippies at Belgrade Theatre um, when, uh, for a little while. And then he did he did the set for the Illuminatus film, Ken Campbell's film, and I used to go down to the National. That was on at the National, but he didn't have a budget, so we would have to steal all the set from skips and all that around <laughs> that part of the world, out under the arches. Uh, and so I'd help him build that. Thank you, darling. <laughs> That's my daughter, hey. Yeah, so I so and then they asked, and then I did the bunny men with them, and I did all the lighting and stage design for them, a bit of teardrops and all that. Mm. So, uh, and then he came, just uh, when it was '87. He talked to me about what he was doing with Jimmy, right. and that started all this lark. <laughs> <laughs> and you met Jimmy first, then you said, yeah, 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 yeah. That was when I did first thing. I think. I think I met them when I filmed that stuff on the top of the tower. They did a lot of graffiti stuff then, and they, I remember they asked me to do stills for them graffitiing tower records in Piccadilly, and I thought, I know, am I going to get arrested or anything? But we didn't seem to get arrested. <laughs> Although we, should, we probably should have done many times. On the motorway, for example. Yeah. <laughs> probably should have done. What, what happened on the motorway? Well, we, they wanted to do Grim Up North, and so. They asked for a motorway to be closed with speakers. And um, <laughs> Francis, my wife, found a location which was actually, ironically, near Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> Where well, we managed to get a, a motorway under construction. But what we hadn't realised was that the, it was under construction, so there was no white lines. So Francis and I were on our hands and knees with white gaffer tape. And all the white lines on the motorway. It's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, so, so you've known Bill a, a long time. Yeah, yeah. Since he was 16. Yeah. So, what were you up to One of the memories I have is him kicking me. He's a big lad, Bill. And I remember us having a bit of a conversation about something. And he took umbrage and he kicked me in the chest. Which is why I'm always nice to him now. <laughs> <laughs> What, what was it? The, I can't talk about that. Okay. No. <laughs> um, so, you, um, how did working with Bill and Jimmy compare to working with other people on programs and films? Uh, well, it was great. What we, the relationship we had was they would come up with very mad ideas for films, and I would, I was. It, it came ready for them. They had the ideas for what they wanted to do. Jimmy was a brilliant art director and also set, he built all the sets and all that. So my job really was to translate, to work out how to get that on the screen. And I was lucky enough to work with some brilliant, well I won't call them 
technicians, but the artists that in their own field. So I had a brilliant, pardon me, cameraman and a fantastic uh, producer, line producer at Pinewood, who could get me all of that towards the end, the big stuff. Yeah. For next to nothing, we used to be because we were doing quite interesting stuff. <laughs> we would get cameras lent to us by Panavision for next to nothing. They, Panavision, kindly designed that snorkel camera that did all the model stuff and all that and they they used to look after us so well i think they thought because of the scale we were working on that i'd end up making feature films and i'd pay them back but that didn't ever happen <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned this illuminati you said you said they stole from uh, and they, they stole up by years from that I mean, were you sort of I didn't ever ask. Right. Yeah. I didn't ever ask. they I didn't ever ask about I don't know what twenty three means. Yeah. I didn't ever ask what was behind it. I, I, I was pretty focused on trying to make those mad ideas happen really. Um, so I yeah. I don't I don't know whether I don't know what, what it's about. <laughs> I still don't know what it's all about. Yeah. I mean there's so many people involved in there weren't that many. There was only a very tight few of us, right. really. About eight or nine that were sort of planning everything and making everything come. Mm. The joy of working with KLF was that, and Jams, and Bill and Jimmy, was that they, we didn't have to go through a record company because they, 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 they did have a few bob until something happened. Um, <laughs> and um, so they could fun things and we and we were getting really good deals so you know it's big stuff but we got because of the, all the favors we got um, we were able to do it you know with a, with with the money they had available but they were ne nothing was ever questioned if I said we needed to buy a Viking lum lumbo I, <laughs> yeah, suddenly the money was there to go and buy one which I bought in Bristol hey! uh, square rigs was it square four square I think a shipyard that used to be down there down on the on the dockside. How do you buy a Viking It's hard work. <laughs> well, actually, it's not that hard work. I saw it there, and I thought that'll do. And I went in, and I said, "How much do you want for it?" And they told me, and I, we bought it. But the problem was with the Viking ship. We got it up. We took it up to Pinewood and filled the tank, which takes three days. And then when we put it in the water, it sank. <laughs> so on the DVD, there's a film of the film, and you'll see them attaching that longboat to a crane that was very very clever cl special effects guy on the crane so it was bobbing in the water not underneath the water because that wouldn't have been good and not floating in the air because that would have looked silly but they, they they it was all suspended on a cable with all those vikings in it and and some quite big talent you know some big names i, I wasn't I should have been a lot more nervous about health and safety, but I wasn't. It was 1991, so we didn't have so much worries about that then. <laughs> did a bit, did a bit, actually. <laughs> Especially when we set fire to it, because... <laughs> the range went with Pinewood. We got the stage for next to nothing because of Bawley, the, 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 the line producer, and his contacts were brilliant and all the special effects. <coughs> Um, and they said, the only thing, no fire. There's no, you can't, because the <laughs> 007 stage had burned down a couple of years earlier when they did Legend, which was a polystyrene set and the whole thing went up. And they said, no fire. So we didn't mention that we were going to set fire to the... <laughs> it wasn't really set fire to special effects. <laughs> all sorts of things you do with film, you know. You can... <laughs> uh, well, one last question for me. Uh, they had... Um... So they, they did lots of um, uh, lots of projects, so lots of them didn't actually happen. And is there anything that you can tell us about that um, was an idea that was filmed or was going to be filmed? Well, the idea with the Viking ship was that we would take it across the North Sea um, <laughs> and go over to Scandinavia. And I thought that might be a bit ambitious <laughs> because, because people would die. <laughs> you know, art's all right, but you don't want people dying. So that's why we thought it'd be better on a stage. So we, you know, 
we had to have the stage with the biggest tank, which yeah. was our 07 stage. How, how, how did you get that? Bowley. Yeah, yeah. Bowley used to just ever that. I don't know where he got that submarine. That just turned up. <laughs> <laughs> because at Pinewood, you've got all the back lots. So there's loads of stuff that is sort of sitting there, really, and it's a shame not to use it. Um, so we would sort of go scavenging a bit. A bit like when I did that set with Bill <laughs> underneath the arches. Although we weren't nicking from skips, yeah. we were nicking from great big Bill's film sets. <laughs> <laughs> so you were sort of doing the same thing, really, just on a bigger scale. Yeah, yeah with make do and mend, yeah. make do and mend, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so open it out to questions to that anyone has. Yeah, I'll go for yes. one. <laughs> Bill, a fantastic film. Any ideas why Kylie said to Jason only got to 102 in the charts <laughs> instead of number one? That was a bit of shit, wasn't it? Really, <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it, it didn't catch anybody's imagination, I don't think. And I, I think because Doctor and the TARDIS was a novelty record. Yeah. And it was not, it was nothing like what they were doing later. And it was still a bit of a novelty and a bit of a piss take. Um, yeah. And all, yeah, I, 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 I you know, I, this it always comes up. I, I, I was just asked to make films. I never knew how they were going to. It's not my job to work out whether people are going to like them or not. Yeah. And also, yeah. the, the great, I, I did a lot of promos um, yeah, yeah. before and a lot after. And if you make a a bad promo for a record that got to number one, you're a great filmmaker. If you make a great promo for a record that doesn't do anything, you're shit. <laughs> and and um, so luckily we, we bounced back up. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like the film and I like the song. Yeah. But, and Bill is very good in close-up. <laughs> <laughs> but I might have gone too far. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, Mark, Mark. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so watching the films in chronological order, it felt like the music and to the degree the filmmaking is getting um, tighter, like the aesthetics getting more focused and tight. And I guess the question is, did it feel like that at the time? And was there a point on that timeline where you really felt, yeah, we're really cooking now, it's really, it's really... It's really I think doing. often you're working out your ideas um, and, uh, you know, as you can see from the film, a lot. Of, one of my ideas is that if you wind in a shot for long enough, beyond it gets a bit boring, and beyond it gets irritating, and you just keep playing that same shot, it becomes art. <laughs> so, so that was my plan, like watching a Tarkovsky movie. That was my plan with the long form films. The long form films were great because promos are bang, 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 you know, fast cutting. Uh, you know, you, you spend weeks working out how a shot can work, and it's on the, it's on the screen for three minutes. So I quite like the long form films because I could have the, the shots on the screen for what seemed like three hours. <laughs> and I'm sure they did for a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, often when you see things like this, you, you get the feeling, you get this feeling of like nostalgia, but also like, you couldn't make something like this anymore, is the feeling that you get, but, but could you? Um, and if so, what would be the analogue today? Is there anyone doing something that would be a little bit like this? Or I think would be sort of. I think feature films are, you know, you get Wes Anderson stuff, which is very stylized and holding shots too long. Um, <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I think I don't. I stopped. I was asked to do a lot of music films after that lot, you know, um, and I did some pretty shit stuff and I did some okay stuff. And it's the same thing I was talking about earlier. You know, if they did well, it was a good film. That does. It, 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 it's tough. You have to. I think you have to make the film you want to make. Mm. With me, it was easy because I knew what they wanted to do. And, I, and and music films are. 
the film is secondary to the music. And I think that it's very dangerous to think that the film is more important than the music. You know, I, I feel that the films are a supporting act to the music rather than the other way around. Um, but I, yeah, I don't watch a lot of music promos anymore. <laughs> I went on to make documentaries after I got a bit cheesed off of music stuff. So I went and made docos. Do you think something like the KLF could exist today? Could exist? I don't think that, I don't know. They were so brave because they just used all the money that they made on the last project to fund the next one. So, I mean, the, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a, couple, a few weeks ago, there was a, um, from a similar sort of era, there was a film about three parties here. Yeah, yeah. And there was a Q&A &A after that. And it was interesting, I don't know, for the... the how different a time it seemed, the sort of 80s, 90s period. And one of the sort of things that came up in relation to the queue was how stuff like the dole was really tightened up from now, how it is. And all, so my question was, going to be vaguely, um, <laughs> how, what sort of things, is there something you see as a loss from that period, and equally is there something that you're like, that... The, the ways of working back in the, in the day then was shite and that can stay in the bin. I think that there's a lot of... The, uh, I think that it's all about return these days. Everybody wants to have a return for what they're doing, whereas then you did it because you wanted to do it. That was an end in itself. <coughs> okay, they, you know, some of them songs did very well, but others... Early didn't do it. <laughs> so, but it, it didn't stop us doing the next one, really. So I think that there's, I think we have a, a shorter time span uh, to succeed these days. You've got to, you've got to succeed on your first, second movie. Otherwise, you're out. You know, that's it. And that's what I found with telly. I made a lot of telly stuff afterwards. And I found that whole, you know, that whole thing about the, 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 the schedulers and the people that were the money people were in control. And that was never something we'd have to care there. And maybe that was of that time. So it felt as so though there was more play. Yeah. Really. And also, you know, Jimmy was a multimillionaire when he was a teenager because he did the Hobbit poster and all that. So it, 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 it seemed like... They didn't have a fear of losing money because mm. they could always come back and do something that might recoup it. And I, I wonder whether we've lost that nerve nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I was going to say, how come the white room didn't get finished? Or did it just not? Well, finish? partly because Bill and Jimmy lost a fucking cutting copy. In those <laughs> days, <laughs> that thing you saw yes. was a cutting copy. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and in those days, we cut everything on film, on 35mm. And the only way, I'm sorry, you probably, a lot of you probably know all this, but the only way you can, you have the cutting copy, which is a, the rushes cut together, and then all the edge numbers and the neg are printed onto the rushes, and then you you take it some, to some clever people and they read all that and then they cut the neg and make the finished film. Well, they asked, they w took the cutting copy to Berlin for a thing they were doing there, which they also took a flock of sheep and <laughs> astroturf and it was a bedlam and somehow the cutting copy never made it back from Berlin. So we all, luckily I had the foresight to get a decent telecine of the, of the cutting copy before they took it off and that's all you saw, which is why you've got all those yeah. China graph marks, which is how you mark up a cutting copy. And I, we agonised about whether we should include that, but nobody's, it's very, very few people have seen The White Room, mm. and it, there was a feature film planned around it, which was written, costed, cast, um, but we've, we've, to be honest, the promos were getting so big 
we didn't need to make a feature film really, if you know what I mean. We, well, we well, were doing the scope. I'm, I'm not bothered about working with actors, if I'm honest. I, I'd rather <laughs> yeah, work with that, the that would be something you know, with, with, with filmmaking. With, with, um, with words then? Like the, there was a script, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was a script and we cast it. Um, and um, so it sort of, we were so busy, to, you know, that all that lot was, a bit, Crash was, we shot that in 19. Three, was it? Not? 93, I think. But Dan's only just edited that, which is a catalyst for finishing this film, really. Because that was, we didn't really have an ending. <laughs> so I, I thought, and there's been a few films made about them. Um, and I just thought it might be nice, well, the BFI actually asked if we could just put a compilation together. But I thought it, it might be nice to tell the story simply from the filmmaking point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and the successes and the failures. Yeah, yeah. Mainly failures. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, darling. You didn't ask, uh, I wasn't asked to ask this question, but I think people might be interested in how you met Bill. Well, I was, yeah. When I was at the club. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were on the piss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was <laughs> I've got a boring one, but uh, I watched it obviously before with you at South Bank. But this time when I watched the uh, White Room, I was thinking how much crew was there when you were making it because you really made it feel like it was just them two in the car. And there were certain moments when it kind of cut back from that and you were like, oh no, actually there's someone else there or a few other people there. The, but who was there? Okay, Where was so, it? So we, after Doctor and the Tardis, we thought, oh, right. Jimmy said he wanted to make a road film without all the boring bits, like yeah. a story or <laughs> dialogue or anything actually happening. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's quite pure. Yeah, you know. shots of fire. So we went out uh, to the Sierra Nevada. Sierra Nevada, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in southern Spain, cowboy country, okay, okay, okay. and we did a recce, and we sort of found that castle, and we found it. But we were, we wanted the story to be quite vague, really, and um, people can make their own mind up or not, or walk out. I don't know. Anybody. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was. <laughs> it was, um, it was j when we went out to film it. There was a cameraman, Henry Braham, who, who shot everything. Uh, all the KLF stuff, who's now making big movies in Hollywood, obviously. And um, there was a camera assistant, a, a clapper loader, me, Bill, Bill and Jimmy, and a, a production assistant, and that was it. That was so a just very, like very tiny crew. Two cars driving around. Two cars, just. Yeah. Like two cars. But what, what were you driving? The, the, what were you then? No, I was driven, darling. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> What was the other car on the road then? Oh, our camera car. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, we had a camera. And the camera She's car... The car is it, like? So the, so the, the <laughs> reason, the, the camera, <laughs> the camera assistant was a, 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 a chap called Matthew Allwork, who was, I got introduced to him by Henry and by my agent. They, they, he had, they, um, the, the, what were they called? Aerial camera systems were had their base in Shepparton, and they used to do it. Obviously, aerial stuff, but they'd also come up with new rigs that would very innovative rigs. Like they'd have they created a, a tracking thing which would gyroscopically um, yeah, control, you know, so it was all steady, and that would go alongside sprinters for the Korean mm. Olympics, and we would try out their stuff on our films. Mm. So all that swooping stuff, which became a bit of a trademark, of all the stuff through London, which incidentally, it's got all the landmarks of London, but not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Matthew and Henry used to work together and get, get, the, get very stylish shots, you know, very innovative shots. The way we got those shots was to bolt a steady cam onto the back of a uh, Isuzu Trooper, back doors off, mm. so you could you could swoop around with a steady cam, 
and get, and get all that stuff. Yeah. So although there was a few of us, they were clever people. Mm -hmm. I won. Yeah, um, were you at the 1992 Brit Awards? No. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Next question. No. I know all about it. Tell us, about it. Oh, tell us your memory of it. Well, I wasn't there. Okay. <laughs> and I know what I I knew what they were thinking of doing. Right. I mean, Bill was going to chop his hand off. <laughs> you know, and then Bill would have uh, Bill would, would be capable of doing that. I just thought. Everybody had gone fucking mad <laughs> at that point. I mean, they went a bit madder afterwards, obviously, but they had all gone a bit mad. Everybody had gone a bit... We were burnt out after making all those... Most of those films were made in 1991 in one year. So everybody was a bit frazzled, really, by then. So I thought it was time for a break for me. Yes, sir? Uh, at the end of Justify the Agent, yeah, there's that credit of the KLF would like to thank the five for making all this impossible. Yes. Who are the five and why did they make that? I was in a sulk th uh, throughout that whole edit, Dan, because yeah, I, can tell. I <laughs> didn't like all that graphic stuff and all that shit because I thought it would age really badly, which it did, but now, 30 odd years later, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> because the whole thing about that film is. I just, well, you know, because you bloody edited it. I didn't want to change what we did 30 odd years ago. So everything, you know, the, the really, really boring bit in, in the white room, I know it's all boring, don't you? Right? <laughs> but the really boring bit, that party scene, we could have recut that, but I thought we had to, we had to honor what we did 30 odd years ago. So, I can't remember what the bloody question was. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Oh, it's the five. Who the five? Who the five? I don't know. Oh, right. I, was, I was in a corner sulking, <laughs> ordering a bit more wine, probably, in a, in a really posh edit suite we were in in Soho. Simply, <laughs> sort, of, sort of strange stuff, but in the, in the booklet for the Blu ray, there's a sort of story about the wine. And it, says it starts from a mysterious contract that they received. Can you say anything about that? No. <laughs> Not that would be any value. It was, we, we, Bill wrote a whole script around it, and um, we were, that was going to be the proper feature film. So that was called the inner film, The White Room, and the other film was uh, all of gangsters and, 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 and tough boys and all that sort of thing, proper, proper filmmaking, but we didn't really get round to that. <laughs> <laughs> Question up there. So, KLF, would you say they enjoyed the chaos? I think they were creators of chaos, really, weren't they, I guess. I mean, they, you know, the whole thing started off with Ford Time Lord being the, being the bat, being the spokesman, which the tabloids loved until they kept it going and then they thought the boys were taking the piss and then they turned against them and you know all the rest of it so um, also 69 or 43 everything oh, okay. as you can see <laughs> <laughs> which i don't know okay so the big ones which is i can never understand the big ones right at the end, which we shot on 07 on 35, they were made for three because we were making them for America, which was a waste of bloody time because it didn't ever take off in America. Well, actually, I think, I think uh, Justified Nature did. But it, yeah, it was a funny time, you know, for filmmaking because your, your marketplace was really, um, what was it called? I can't even remember what it was really called. The, you know, the, music channel or whatever it was called, and TV. So that would be on tellers. Most people would consume all that on tellers. And then when we started making the long form, like White Robe, we shot that, I think, 69 or even wider, I think. But that is why we, part of the reason we did the little commentary bits in between, we could go to black, so nobody would notice that the aspect ratio is changing. See? 
<laughs> Told you now. <laughs> Uh, maybe one last question, if anyone has it yet. Uh, do you know the reason why you picked up the dead eagle in the library? Uh, <laughs> do you know the reason why you picked up the dead eagle? No! It was there! It was there. I, I remember, I've got stills of... We tied it to the bonnet, and then we thought that was a bit cool. But it was dead. It stunk like hell! It reeked, it reeked! Bill's coat just reeked of dead eagle fur. <laughs> um, but it was that it was in the, those ra it was where we found it in the railway track, and that idea of that long shot with the railway tracks, and the parallel to the railway track, and him carrying an eagle, it was too good to resist. <laughs> so didn't seem to need a reason. Really. <laughs> <laughs> there was a dead bird in the right of mail as well. Oh, there's a lot of dead animals yeah. in the uh, old carcasses. It wasn't an eagle, no, it's not. no, it was, it was seagulls and seagull all sorts. <laughs> was a swan a, f a fluke? Yes. No way. Yes, <laughs> we were. Yeah, God, I don't know how you'd get a swan wrangler up there, but <laughs> I, did, I mean, I did. Na I did a lot of natural history, and I know how clever these guys are. But even the best animal wranglers, to get them to land just behind where the angels are, with the sun setting behind them and all the rest of it, um, that was just. God's gift to us, really, on that day. The, 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 the filmmaking gods smiled on us on that day. And, and, and they, you know, the angels were as, uh, in every film because they were so brilliant. Really. All the people who were there in the road, who, who were they? They were journalists. They were mainly journalists. Um, they didn't know what was happening. You can see one of them getting really cheesed off with Bill taking his alcohol. And I think, I, I can lip read, and it was pretty much explosive. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they were journalists, they didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was fucking going on. <laughs> In fact, I was just, you know, I knew we were making a film. <laughs> that was about my grasp of it. <laughs> I've got over there another question. Um, how difficult or expensive was it to get Martin Sheen in to narrate? Oh. Uh, I'll tell you how much it cost, exactly. I gave him a lift to the airport and a packet of Dutchy oat cakes, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I was working with him on a, a, a documentary series that we were making with the BBC for PBS America, and he came over to do the American voiceover, and we were staying at the same hotel, and we'd meet for breakfast and have a drink in the evening, and all his actor friends with Carl, which was great and I talked to him about I was just about we'd finished this more or less of the cut and I just needed a voiceover and I said to him one night <coughs> mine I tell you what I'm, I'm on this project at the moment and I'm trying to find a voice I want somebody that sounds a bit like you and um, <laughs> <laughs> I did remember the name of the film to be fair otherwise that would have been rude and, and, and he said oh well Let's say then, um, can you get me a script? And I, we didn't have finished the script, so we drove back to Bristol. Francis and I finished the script, drove back up and put it under his door. And then he came at about seven o'clock and he came down to breakfast and said, oh, I reckon we can do this. Let's nick some time off the BBC, use his studio time <laughs> to do it. And um, he was just such a lovely man. I mean, he is a lovely man, you know. He, he, he was sort of like the idea of it and I said look how do we deal with it do I talk to your agents what what do you want to do you know obviously do you want to cut not that it's ever made any bloody money but that's another thing um, and he said no no if you've got kids just if it makes any money give it to your kids but I could do with a lift, lift to the airport <laughs> <laughs> that's the sort of chap he is and all, all, following on from that throughout all the stuff we did the film industry was so supportive. We were, they sort of liked what we were doing. So we were given, we were given cameras by Panavision. We were given film and all the rest of it. It's a, it, it can be. I don't know whether it is still because I've done it for a while. 
but it's a very supportive industry, especially if they think you're going to make big films later and pay them all back. <laughs> we didn't do that. <laughs> okay, well, I could carry on, but I, I, I'd like to carry on, but I think we ought to um, stop there. And uh, there's, um, DJ, there's going to be a DJ in the bar, um, so if you just give a big round of applause and thank you. Yeah.